talked, and we talked a bit about when you when there is urge to write. So have you ever experienced writer's block? So there's is that an urge not to write? Or how, what's that? Why don't we start at that? Yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, <clears throat> no, I don't. I don't have writer's block because, as uh, Brad was saying, um, I I write novels, television shows, plays, uh, articles, essays, documentaries. I worked on almost every medium there is in writing. So. One year when I'm not doing a novel, I'll do a play, and if I don't have an idea for a play, I'll work on, um, on, a, on a, not a, a nonfiction book. Uh, so while it's like you know, using a farming metaphor, while I'm sowing one field, I'm reaping another field. Because it usually takes me about a year, again, much like I, the, I heard down there, to sort of develop an idea that I want to tackle. But while I'm developing that idea, I'm working on. I'm writing an actual another idea. So I've always got. I've always got some something going on. Uh, hamster wheel. Um, yeah, writer's block is, is kind of an interesting word. I, I, I think what it is is I make my living as a writer. I can't afford to have writer's block. And the bottom line is that I, I don't even know if I'm any good as a writer. But I finish my stuff. Like <laughs> so, in a way, like I'll, I'll be absolutely honest. Like as a benchmark, the fact that. I can sit down and finish something is, is something that helps me get me produced. And um, for me, I'll echo just what Brad said that I do always I have an A project and a B project often. And 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 if I, A project something that I just need time away from it, I'll work on the B project. And it does mean that sometimes B project floats up to the top and go, whoa, there was way more here than I thought there was. But it means that I, I keep going. Um, so in that sense, I you know the the ways of Ways of dealing with writer's block for me are not necessarily uh, trying to crack one, crack a nut that doesn't want to be cracked at that point. It's not a joke. <laughs> and but to actually just keep writing, even even if it's not the project that I, I intend to work on. I actually have always thought that there are a few different kinds of writer's block. I I, I think that um, <clears throat> I think that writers uh, kind of get nervous about around the the subject matter of writer's block. I think that. Um, I don't know. There's something dangerous in it. That, oh, writer's block! It could like because some actors, you know, uh, you hear about these actors who somewhere in their career they realize, oh, they can't go on stage or something, and then their career ends because they just can't get in front of an audience. So I think to a certain degree, some writers think, oh, writer's block could be this thing that could cripple me or whatever. But I, I actually, um, I think that there, there are different kinds, and and some kinds are actually kind of healthy. Um, but I, and this is just my theory. My theory is. The first kind of writer's block is the one we typically think of, which usually happens to inexperienced writers, both first-time writers, where they're writing their first draft, and they write something that really sucks, and they get discouraged, and they think, my god, I'm terrible, and then they stop. And when you're an experienced writer, you realize, yeah, it sucks. It's I've all shit in the beginning. Exactly. <laughs> this first draft is the worst piece of crap that I've ever written. And it has to be. The first draft has to be the worst one. You don't want the last draft to be the worst one, right? <laughs> So it yeah, it happens. Yeah, it happens. So I think a lot of I mean I think that's typically what we think about with writer's block. I think, however, the the other kind of block that happens to me a lot, which is well, there's one kind which is I get to a point in, in, in structuring something, or I get to a point with writing with a character, and the character could do this or that, and they're both fascinating. But if I do this, I've got to rewrite the entire play. And if I do this, I've got to rewrite the ending. And so I, I have to stop for a second. I just have to go, okay, well, what's the story, though? What am I trying to communicate? Because, you know, you can go this way, you can go that way. But I just, you have to sort of dig deep. And I think another kind of writer's block, too, which is, I, I think, a good one, too, which is you've written it. You've written this really horrible draft or whatever. And then you do a rewrite. <clears> it gets better. And then you do another rewrite. And then you think, oh, my gosh, it's finished. And you're about to show it to somebody. But then you think, you know what? There's that one scene. Gosh, I think it can be better. I don't know what, but I think it can be better. And to me, that's I enjoy that kind of block. I enjoy like something that where it's like you're looking at a scene going, oh, and people can even say to you, oh, that's a great scene. But inside, you know, it's like, oh, there's something else. I don't know what it is. And then one day, you're peeling a banana, or you're walking down the street, and you go, it's gerbils. <laughs> but you know, and just you go, oh my god, and you run home and you write down gerbils, and then it makes the thing much better. Anyway, but that's just my theory. Yeah, I, I, I spoke a bit about writer's block and doing something else, and I find the two things that really help me 
uh, when I'm not sure where I'm going or if I'm, I'm dealing with a problem, are to either go and I do a lot of painting and drawing and to work on that, or to work out physically, because they both uh, use another part of the brain and they let the writing part of my brain go dormant for a while. And, and that seems to be sometimes where the best part of the ideas come from. I'll be in the shower, I'll be working out, I'll be painting something, and I won't even be thinking of what I'm doing, and suddenly the idea will come to me, and it's because I've rested that part of my brain that likes to do the writing, but something I'm experiencing, and maybe you know you guys are experiencing it too, and it's very different uh, than when I was, say, 22 when I was writing, or even 32 when I could sit down and I would write for eight or ten hours straight, and yes, it would all be horrible, and it would be way too long, but then I'd go and sift through it, and find the stuff that works, but I find as I get older that that kind of energy, I just don't have it anymore. I can't sit down and write for those long extended periods of time. I mean, what for one thing, I just can't sit that long anymore. But for another thing, I get really tired. I mean, after four hours of intense writing, I'm exhausted. And what I'm trying to figure out now as I age is how do I allocate that energy I don't have it to waste anymore. And I find what I do now is I tend to think a lot more about the writing so that when I sit down, I write more slowly, but I tend to write more precisely, where that was not the case for many, many years. And I think part of my struggle as an aging writer is trying to find that energy in that time to sit down and actually do it and to realize that, okay, you're not going to be writing for 12 hours today, so you better make the three or four hours that you're going to be writing really concentrated and really mean it. And I find my whole style of writing and the whole idea of being blocked is different to me. I mean, when I was younger, if I didn't write three scenes in a day, I felt like I was blocked. I'm quite happy now if I sit down for three hours and walk away with a page and a half, and I'm happy with it, to, to work that way. And I think that, that our brains work differently as we age, and the way we do things are become very different. And as, for me as a writer, it's been a fascinating process to see how I started and the way I used to work and, and how differently I work now. And as Andrew says, as you get more experienced and as you work in different mediums and things, you develop a kind of technique that even if you don't have something to say necessarily, just putting something on the page, there's a good chance that when you go back to it, something from it will work, something of it will tweak something. So that idea of, okay, even if I don't want to do it, even if it's not there, just write something and trust that unconsciously some of that is going to be important. Even if you don't keep it now, it'll come up later on for something else. And the other thing I've stopped doing is I used to beat myself up about um, going on a, a Google trip, you know, where you, you're writing and then you stop and then you'd look up, oh, I really need to research the Rocky Mountains. Oh, the Rocky film, that was really good. Oh, what was in that? Oh my God, that actually is really good. I wonder what she's doing now. Oh, look at that. I used to really beat myself up about like doing that for a while, but a couple of times what's happened is, um, I mean, like you go off of looking for one thing, and then you branch through the, the myriad of bits of information about humanity, and something else you stumble across can relate to what you're writing. And it's weird that how it, it's synchronistic how it happens. But, so I don't, I, I don't beat myself up about it anymore. If you go on a little Google trip, if you stop for a second and look up like, oh, what was that musical again that I didn't like when I was 12? It's okay. It's, it's not um, You're still feeding your brain. Yes. Exactly. Whatever you're doing, yeah. you're still feeding your brain. You're still, you're still getting stimulated. You're still learning things. And I think that's really important. I mean, building up, I, I will spend the whole day sometimes not writing and agonizing about it and then sit down at midnight and write until 3 o'clock in the morning non-stop and yeah. it'll be good, but that, that whole process of I should be writing, I shouldn't be watching TV, I shouldn't be going for a walk, I shouldn't be doing this, I shouldn't be doing that, uh, you know, I come to realize even though I have to go through that, it's actually kind of like a build-up to that release and to sit down and, and, and just do it doesn't work, it needs yeah. that build. So I, I trust that as being a momentum that I'm building up that's going to take me into it. Just to, just um, Andrew's story about kind of the Google trips. So there's one crazy thing that I do, which is not super crazy, is I have I have two laptops. One is kind of a much more modern one, and one is like my old iBook from 2006, and it can't get online. Oh, <laughs> and I will, I will work on that uh, laptop, which is fine for word processing, um, when, I'm, when I'm stuck or if I feel like just my focus is just not... Uh, really tuned and I will and uh, the same the other thing I do is like uh, in my house I I don't write at the same desk that I do my green work and then I do my emails. So 
I work at a, at a different desk, or I work in a different spot, oh, yeah. and that my brain mm -hmm. actually has to, it's physically in a different space. So that's, that's a crazy thing that I do, because I don't have the discipline <laughs> to go away and come back, that I'm actually a lot of, and you actually forget, you're like, kind of like, I have my phone, this work, do this, but, you know, you actually kind of forget, and you're just there with, you know, your work, and, and, and you get into it. Um, the other crazy thing that I do, which is that's I think it's a little more crazy, and is when there's more desperate times, is I do something called um, writer in exile. The writer in exile is I put my laptop in my bag, and I have a goal, set a goal in mind of what I want to write that day, and like two or three scenes usually, and I will leave the house. And I will leave the house, and I'm not allowed to take transit, and I can't come back to my own apartment until I'm finished my goal. Ooh. And so and so I will walk and go to a cafe. I will walk and go to a library. So if you ever see me and it's like 10.30 at night and I'm with my laptop, I'm in the West End from the East End, I've walked all that way and I've been walking and writing throughout that day to, to achieve that goal. So that's, that's what I call writer in exile. And if you see me do that, you're like, just leave me alone. <laughs> what's, what's interesting about that, though, Marjorie, is the, the walking, is the walking yeah, and right. what walking yeah. does to your brain. Yeah, yeah. A lot of brain, I mean, again, again I, I agree 100%. When I'm stuck, when I'm really stuck, the best thing I can do is go for a long walk. Because after a point, something about the process of walking makes your brain start to work differently again. And it starts to do something. And most writers I know can talk about walking mm -hmm. when they're stuck. I used to live in a house uh, that, on the third floor that was just a big room, and uh, I just used to pace back and forth in the room, just walk, 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 until I, until I solved whatever I had to do and sit down and, and write it. Yeah, I, I think as humans, we don't walk enough, and I don't say that just in terms of being physical and staying in shape and things like that. I mean, in terms of there's something that happens to your thinking process when you're walking, particularly when you're walking alone. It does something, I think, to most people's brains and stimulates it in a really interesting way. And I think that part of creativity is actually really tied to walking. And you have to do it. I agree. I think it's something that's probably primordial. I think it's something that's probably been within, within us for, uh, you know, since the beginning of time, where, you know, we, that's what people would do. They would go on a journey. You hear, you know, the, 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 the great novels are written about that. People going on a journey and, and experiencing things and just taking in the world and having that process through your, through your cerebral cortex. But I think it's, I think you're right, I think it's essential. And all storytelling is a journey, so maybe in mm -hmm. taking that physical journey, your brain is taking a creative journey as well that's going to feed into whatever you happen to be writing. But one thing I'd add is, back at the, like everybody complains about, oh, I don't want the internet near me, but I used to, back before the internet, I know you kids might not remember that, but before the internet, I used to go to libraries to write, and that, it's the same thing. You sit in the library and start writing, it's like, oh, geez, it, was that that James Joyce novel I never read? I didn't take a look at that. And the next thing you know, you're doing the same thing that, you know, you do now on the internet. See, that's, not, a, that's not an issue for me, because I hate research. <laughs> <laughs> that's why almost all my plays and novels and stories take place in a contemporary reserve in central Ontario. <laughs> because you don't have to research. And I, I, I research. Think, wait, if I didn't live it, I don't want to figure it out. Uh, no. <laughs> so I, used to be, I used to be a journalist years ago for CBC, and... I just was like, why do I need to know this? <laughs> my problem is I love research too much. That's my problem. Like, oh, I'm in this. Oh, I'll put this in. Well, I'll put that in. Now the play's like 15 hours long. That's okay. <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah, exactly. 